Okay, so we need to understand what soil health is. Soil health is the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains your plants, animals, and humans. Here recently, I tend not like, do not like to use the word sustain, okay, because we don't need to sustain systems that are, that are somewhat degraded, I have figured out over the years. We need to regenerate them, okay? And so some of the, the uh, words in this definition that you need to pay attention to are things like function. You know, so what is soil function? Well, soil function has to do with the four ecosystem processes that happen in every agro ecosystem. Dr. Zach mentioned some of the stuff here earlier. We always have a carbon cycle that's working in that agro ecosystem, in that cropland, in that pasture land. We have a bio community, soil food web, plants uh, and animals, you know, it's the bacteria and the fungi and the predators that feed on them like uh, protozoa and nematodes. What happens with that is, is once we get the biology in the soil, they actually create and give us more infiltration, more porosity, more structure to that soil system. They incorporate organic matter, stable organic carbon in that system. Then the other thing that we have that creates that water cycle that we need to have we get better infiltration and water availability in the soil profile. And then the nutrient cycle comes into play. We have both soluble nutrients, and then because of the biology, we have a lot of plant available nutrients, uh, namely we tend to call them microbial metabolites or organic forms of nitrogen, like amino acids and things like that, that we can use. And that creates the physical stability and support and habitat for the biodiversity. Now just understand that 90% of soil function is mediated by the soil microbes. Okay, so biology is very, very important in these ecological systems. What's happened over the years in conventional agriculture, just simply because of how we farm, we've had a downward spiral of soil degradation. We've lost organic matter. Uh, we've increased the amounts of tillage that we do. We are now understanding the importance of reducing tillage. Uh, we actually break up aggregates that have been formed in the soil. We get crusting, surface compaction, <clears throat> excuse me. Infiltration is decreased. We start to see things like ponding of water, top of the soil. If you ever see that, you don't have a proper water cycle, okay? So we need to understand that we're degrading all these systems and it's very difficult for us to enhance or increase crop yields we're causing malnutrition, malnutrition problems because we're not getting the nutrient density in a lot of the plants that we're growing. From an agronomist standpoint, that's really important to me because many of the metabolic functions are not happening in that plant like they're supposed to, okay? So we've gotten a de degeneration of ecosystem processes. So these are the unintended consequences of a cultivated soil. Less water infiltration, Decreased biological activity, decreased biological diversity because we grow monocultures. Uh, we don't have any efficient nutrient cycling. I'll talk about the nutrient forms here in just a bit. Uh, increased summer temperatures. I'm really going to emphasize on that because I work throughout the state of Texas and I can tell you that we're sterilizing that top one to two inches of that soil system. We're killing the biology. Okay, and I'll illustrate that to you. Of course, we get increased uh, erosion potential and decreased aggregation. So the productivity of conventional agricultural systems are maintained with increased technology, labor, fuel, nutrients, pesticides, and water, and it literally becomes an input-driven system. We use our new technologies to cover for all that we've lost out of that system. The example is we irrigate more. The example is we use herbicides to take the weeds out because the ecological succession that Dr. Zach talked about is not there that we need to have, okay? There's a lot of things that have happened and the challenge is, you know, how can we regain that soil function, those ecosystem processes, and the resource concerns are addressed, inputs can be reduced, and agricultural productivity is sustainably maintained. Is it possible to get all those three things? The answer is yes. Okay. The way that we do that is we look at soil aggradation climb. We start paying attention to the initial biology activity that we have, 
it leads to more organic matter turnover and build up of organic matter in the soil system itself. You have to have the proper biology to get that done. I'm going to point out to you how to build organic matter in other slides in my presentation. So as we improve the nutrient cycling, at some point in time, if you're out there observing these things, you'll start to see a noticeable change. You'll start to see improved soil structure. You'll start to see an increase in water infiltration compared to what it was when we started this, this process of soil health. And then you see an improved water availability within that system. And overall, what you're doing is you're regenerating those ecosystem processes that are there. Okay, there's been a changing vision of soil. Now we don't pay attention to the fixed soil properties, but these farmers and ranchers have really changed the health and the function of their soil. They understand it's about building organic matter. They understand it's about getting the proper biology to help them cycle nutrients through that system. Okay, I'm gonna use this example of Rush, uh, Russell Jackson uh, in Oklahoma. Okay, uh, slide that I stole for Dr. Jim Johnson there in the back. But what you see on the left, this is Russ Jackson's. He's got cover crops, no-till. He's also seeing electric fence right there. He's grazing those covers. But you don't see any standing water out there. Across the road here, you see a lot of degradation. You see water ponding. That person is tilling the soil. And essentially, it's degradation of those ecosystem processes that are there. So I'm just using this to show you an example of a regenerative type of farming on the left versus a degenerative cycle type of farming on the right. Okay, very obvious when you see these types of things uh, out in the field. A lot of the farmers that I work with, as NRCS, I've always paid attention to resource concerns such as compaction, organic matter depletion, erosion, concentration of salts or other chemicals. One thing that has happened is that we've recently added two resource concerns, new resource concerns, aggregate instability. Okay, we want to build aggregates, not degrade them. And then soil organism habitat loss or degradation. Uh, earlier you saw the difference in color when Brandt did the uh, slake and aggregation test. One of the reasons you get that difference in color is because one soil, you're starting to do no-till and you're starting to get more fungal activity in that soil. Particularly if you have mycorrhizal fungi, they produce a, a, a glomalin that they coat their filamentous hyphae with. And that glomalin, when it's left off in the soil, it's a deep, dark brown color. So that soil will actually turn, change color, okay, because of that. So we want to get those types of soil organisms there because they also help us build organic matter. Okay, so those are the new resource concerns that we need to pay attention to. The aggregate instability, we always do slake and aggregation tests to illustrate that process. And then we're looking at that that's something that's management induced. That's a management induced degradation of the stable soil aggregates. You destabilize soil carbon, you get surface crusting, reduce water infiltration, water holding capacity and aeration, depress resilience because we're not storing stable carbon in that soil system, particularly things that possibly come from plants such as uh, fats, lipids, and oils. That helps uh, plants go through stress better if we can get those types of uh, materials there. And then the big thing is soil organism habitat loss or degradation. We want to get that diversity in that system and create the space and the shelter for those microorganisms to exist. Okay, we simply just don't have that in the tilled uh, soil condition. You don't have a lot of the different habitats that's needed for the diverseness of biology. This is one of the things that I do when I go out with farmers uh, in the field, is that we'll go out and we'll take sample of their soil. Uh, it's in the field, it's been tilled, and we put that in a little strainer and get it wet, and then flip it over on a, on a, on a board. And then what we do is we also do the same thing from an area of soil that's nearby that hasn't been disturbed. Okay, and we'll illustrate that to show the differences between a non-functioning and a functioning soil. Okay, 
because that non-functioning soil will not maintain its, its uh, structure. It will get as flat as a pancake, okay? So we want to follow these four core principles that conserve and regenerate soil ecosystems. We want to minimize disturbance, maximize living cover, maximize biodiversity. That includes the integration of livestock possibly at some point in time, if we can do that. And then fourth, maximize continuous living roots in that soil. It's important to understand that that's very important because what we're trying to do with soil health principles is support those high functioning soils by protecting the soil aggregates, organism habitat, and soil organic matter. And then we're trying to feed and fuel the soil biology, improve resilience, and improve soil organic matter. We do that through these four principles, okay? The minimize disturbance and maximize soil cover, we're maintaining soil aggregates, manage erosion, buffer temperature, reduce evaporation, maintain soil organic matter. Disturbance can decrease the habitat for the soil organism. Simple tillage, okay? We destroy the soil tr structure, but we can have other forms of disturbance occurring, okay? We can also not only get physical, but we can get chemical disturbance where we overuse fertilizer and pesticides. You heard earlier from Dr. Zach that that was a, uh, a detrimental sometimes when we use inorganic fertilizers, especially when we use them excessively. Uh, biological, overgrazing. Worst biological system thing that we have is when we fallow the ground for six to eight months. Back in my home area, I'm originally from the Rio Grande Valley of Texas and down around uh, south of Corpus Christi. And we have a lot of uh, cotton and uh, grain sorghum rotation. And the big thing is, is that we fallow that ground for six to eight months every year. And we till it. It hadn't been customary to till that ground anywhere from five up to seven, maybe eight times during the year. And I just saw a recent uh, soils test of people that were trying to help transition. Their organic matter content was 0.18%, okay? So they're really not grasping the understanding. They're thinking that they, they want me to tell them to use more fertilizer <laughs> to get that yield, and that's not the case. Their ecosystem processes have been degraded totally. They're not getting a lot of water in the ground. That's one of the other things. These are the practices that we use. Uh, I'm not gonna go over that. Uh, just understand that when we do tillage, especially if we do tillage like in the fall of the year, at the end of harvest, okay, which is customary, in, the, in many of our areas that I work, you're gonna get this soil respiration. You're stimulating copiotropic bacteria in that soil. They're eating all the carbon. Okay, so like a bacteria has an eight to one ratio of carbon to nitrogen, okay? It will consume 24 parts of carbon, okay? And then it will respire two thirds of that in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And then it, it does that to maintain its eight to one ratio. But that carbon dioxide, that's your organic matter being blown off. That process right there will happen three to four days after you do that tillage operation. Okay, not only do we stimulate types of biology there, such as the, the, the type of copiotropic bacteria that break down all the organic matter, okay, and, and release carbon, but then you're also gonna have protozoa that eat all of those types of biology, as long as the conditions exist for them to do that. When they do, half of what they excrete is ammonium, half of what they excrete is a microbial metabolite. But the ammonium, is immediately converted into nitrate by nitrifying bacteria, nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. And that what that does, that anytime you have these tilt conditions, you're gonna have a bacterially dominated system that has nitrate as primarily as its form of nitrogen. You're in an area where you do not want to have that form of nitrogen so much in your system, because it's not water efficient. That plant would use three times the amount of water to convert that nitrate into an amino acid and a protein than it will if it picks up something like ammonium or something like an amino acid. Okay, so as we transition these systems, we wanna change that. We wanna do no-till. We don't wanna stimulate that process. We wanna come in, 
We want to do no-till, and we want the microorganisms to start respiring their CO2 when we have a live living plant on top of the ground. Your stomata and stuff on those, leaf, on those plants, especially cotton, are on the underside of the leaf. So as you get that biological activity, you get the carbon dioxide coming out each morning before that canopy or whatever has sunlight hit it, you're gonna have high levels of carbon dioxide in that crop canopy, okay? That's beneficial to you. That increases the amount of photosynthesis. That increases the carbon cycle, puts more carbon back into that system. System is, perpetuates itself, okay? And it grows, it gets better and better as we do that, okay? We wanna maximize soil cover, maximize soil cover, especially living covers. We need to endure heat stress many times. I work with a lot of till situations and we really need to reduce the temperature of the soil, okay? It conserves moisture and reduces temperature when we have these types of covers, especially living cover. Crop yields are limited more often by hot and dry, not cool and wet. When soil temperatures reach around, say, 95 degrees, 15% of moisture is used for growth. 85% of moisture is lost through evapotranspiration. This particular slide actually comes from Kerrville, Texas from 1956. I happened to be able to speak to the person that made this slide for a technical note. And one of the things he told me was, J.J. McIntyre told me that back then they carried six inch infiltration rings and a thermometer and a shovel. And that's how they went out to talk to a farmer or rancher to illustrate the importance of keeping, keeping temperatures down and the importance of having vegetation and stuff on the ground and biological activity to increase the infiltration rates of water. Water is very critical, especially in the Southwest. Okay? Now I want to point out something else that's happening uh, in our soil systems. This is called the heat dome effect. And I use this example, this is a person I work with in, in uh, Rogers, Texas, close to where I live. And uh, we went out and we took the ambient temperature that day was 105 degrees Fahrenheit. The bare soil surface, okay, with, that we measured was 155 degrees. I worked with two brothers there, it's like Cain and Abel. Okay, but Jonathan's brother tills the you-know-what out of the soil, fertilizers, chemical, whatever, he used to be an ag pilot. So everything's about chemical with him, okay? But his soils were, were registering about 155 degrees, okay? Jonathan's soils where he had warm season, multi-species cover crops and things where he's integrating livestock back onto cropland, soil temperature there was 77 degrees. Jonathan doesn't use any fertilizer anymore. Doesn't have to. He's figured out that the biology, the plants, all these things help to recycle and regenerate these particular things. Whereas his brother is continuing uh, to use all these inputs because he's degrading those ecosystem processes. And the reason I bring this up to you about the heat dome effect, you have such amount of heat being radiated back off of that soil, okay? that what you literally do is you create a, what's called a high pressure system. If you know anything about weather, whenever you have a low pressure system come in with moisture, guess what's gonna happen if you have high pressure there? It's gonna go around it, okay? So you're gonna get less rainfall in these conditions where you have these bare soil surfaces with very, very high temperature. I've actually seen this with uh, thunderstorms, you know, you see the water come out of the cloud, and the soil is so hot, it actually looks like the water gets sucked back up into the cloud. It's just so hot, so intense, that the water evaporates before it ever hits the ground. Okay, and this is something that you don't want to create. In fact, they're having problems with this in San Joaquin Valley in uh, California. If they don't change their ways and start covering the soil, they're going to have a major agricultural collapse that's being predicted here in the next 10 years or so. So it's really important to understand this and to follow some soil health principles to gradually change that. We want to feed the biology, stimulate the below ground diversity, do all these other things that are here. Uh, we want to maximize living cover with cover crop mixtures. 
We want plants that are mycorrhizal. We want plants that are non-mycorrhizal. We want legumes. We want broad leaves. We want grasses. Okay, get that diversity out there. Understand that living roots provide uh, food and shelter for soil organisms. This is just an example. A dead corn root over there on the left. And uh, triticale, I think it's uh, triticale and vetch. And Austrian winter peas on the right. But you notice as he dumps that in that water, you see the white scum that's right here? that's starting to form. Those are the fats, lipids, oils, polysaccharides. They're floating to the top of the water. And that's simply what happens when you put oil in water, it floats to the top. That's essentially, that's what's happening right there. You see this on acres and acres where we put in pipeline, actually, where we backfill pipelines. Uh, you'd always see this scum when we backfilled them with water. You'd see all those polysaccharides and stuff like that. Now the reason I'm bringing that up to you is because plants put root exudates into that soil. Okay, they do that to stimulate the biology. Okay, so that's nature's chemistry at work. The biology is what's going to extract, particularly when the plant first germinates, it's the biology that helps that plant extract the necessary trace elements and things that are needed to form the carbohydrates, the more complex carbohydrates, the proteins, the fats, lipids, oils, okay? You need trace elements and critical trace elements and that biology is what's supplying that to you. Uh, when we talk about compacted soils, I work with a lot of clay soils in Texas. Uh, when we get those polysaccharides and those things into that particular soil, that's the only thing that can get in there. You can see that it, this is very compacted. Look at the size of the bacteria. Then you see the clay platelets, platy structure. And then you see these polysaccharides coming in there. What that does is that you actually get what's called flocculation. The clay particles and clay start to clump up. When they clump up, they create space. And then the next thing that happens is, because we're doing no-till, we're allowing these microorganisms to come in, you're gonna get mycorrhizal filaments that get into those little nooks and crannies, okay? Why is that important? Fungi are the major holders of calcium. If you understand, you gotta have a calcium to magnesium ratio usually of about seven to one, maybe a little bit higher than that. Okay, but that's an indicator when you have these kind of ratios of an open aerobic soil. Okay, you start getting compacted conditions, you start losing these microorganisms out of that system, you're gonna see these ratios start to change, okay? It's an indicator, all right? After you have that happen, then those protozoa are gonna start looking for bacteria. They're gonna create space, more space. And then you get the nematodes in there. They're much larger. They start to create even more space. And then you get to where you start creating these aggregates that are needed and your roots and stuff glide effortlessly through that particular soil. Okay, we've got to have a good aerated, aggregated soil to support some of the biology that we're trying to get, such as free-fixing nitrogen bacteria, as an example. They don't form nodules on the root to exclude oxygen so they can fix nitrogen. They have to grow in population, okay, and then they exclude uh, oxygen within the colony and then their nitrogenase enzyme will work to fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere. But you gotta have a good aggregated soil because you gotta get air into the ground and you gotta have carbon dioxide get out as well as water, you know, come in and out. Infiltration is a very, very big thing, especially all, all the people that I work with. This is just a soils demonstration, uh, infiltration demonstration. We're taking about 444 mLs of water, and we're gonna put it in the six inch ring that represents an inch of water. And we're gonna measure how many minutes it takes to get into that soil, okay? So you take one over the number of minutes times 60, and that's gonna give you inches per hour of infiltration. Normally we do this twice. I don't know if we have our uh, uh, soil scientists over here. I know they always tell me to do it twice. Okay, and I understand that, okay? But when I work with farmers, we go through wet and dry cycles. 
What I want to see is I want that water, when we get a two or three inch rain, I want that water to go in the ground. I, don't, I want that infiltration rate to be in that soil to be aggregated enough that that water goes in the ground. It doesn't pond, it doesn't sit on top of the ground. If it sits on top of the ground, particularly in the summer, in the late spring and summer, we lose it to evaporation. We can't have that or we lose it to runoff. Okay? And when you talk about water, we need to know that an inch, acre inch of water is 27,154 gallons. And I do this a lot. We compare a functioning to a non-functioning soil. This is actually Zach Yanta. His example was is that after working with him for two years, <clears throat> his soils were starting to infiltrate 2.65 inches of water, okay, per hour. And the neighbor, the landlord, was still telling, doing all the wrong practices, his soil infiltrated a half inch. They ended up getting a one and a half inches before we had a training. So that means that on ground that with the two and a half inches of infiltration, you're looking at 71,958 gallons of water. Whereas the neighbor, if he was lucky, only got 13,577, okay? That's the importance of the infiltration rate. More water, more biological activity, you know, to learn how to build that type of ecosystem uh, services that have been degraded. Rain falls and I'm barely seeing a trickle coming out of the field. After we simulate an extremely intense thunderstorm. And I want to show you this here because infiltration is very important. We apply to this soil has run off into this and so jar. you see the tray and, and, and uh, thin, Brant illustrated this to you earlier. Layer of topsoil. You know, you got the runoff and you see the runoff there. And so when you get something like just a half inch, okay, we just apply on those soils that don't infiltrate, intense rainfall this is what you have to worry about. Soil. It's this right here. That water only penetrates very little Obviously, of that soil. We very little and actually what you're doing is you're creating a desert condition. You're not getting the water Meanwhile, into the ground. You do not have a proper water cycle working there. Water's supposed to go in the so ground through your lakes and rivers and streams, we apply. not through the runoff. runoff is clear. Okay. So we really need the to understand that. Pretty simple. Okay. If you want to harvest, create rain, that sponge. Like no-till farmers are doing. Okay. You get that water there. On top. Get that water down in the ground. The sponge underneath. Okay. Prevent the evaporation. Utilize it, and hopefully we'll have more ammonium and microbial metabolites to take advantage of that water. We won't use as much of it. Now there's another way to increase the infiltration rate. Earthworms have been sighted in Texas. Back in 2012, I had a uh, particular uh, presentation, uh, brought Ray Archuleta to Texas, and uh, we had a person there by the name of John Regan from Marlin that we had invited, and he showed up because he was gonna prove us that soil health was a bunch of foo-foo dust, okay? And so he came out there, he listened to us, at least he had an open mind, and he asked me, he said, well, how do I know I'm doing no-till, I'm growing forages and stuff at that time. How do I know if I have earthworms? We'll go out there in the morning, look, okay? And uh, I said, before daylight, I said, you'll see them out on the ground. So he went out there at 6.30 in the morning, found these earthworms all over his place. He had the lumbricus earthworm, this, these real big earthworms, okay, European earthworms. And so he took that picture, and about seven, he forwarded that to me as we were going to start the next day of the workshop. And uh, he said, well, he said, I got earthworms too. He said, they're all over the ground. He said, I never knew I had these things. You know, so it's really important that we get this out there because one of the things that's happening, when you have these earthworms, they're helping us to cycle nutrients, okay? They have nephridia on every segment. So what they do is they take these residues and what they do is they pull them down into the hole, they'll partially digest these residues, and what they're doing by doing that is that they're, they're inoculating those residues, and they'll regurgitate it inside that tunnel. So what they did, they inoculated the bacteria, the bacteria start to grow in number. When that earthworm comes back out of that tunnel, he's gonna eat all of that. Bacteria are one of his food sources. Okay, since bacteria has a low carbon nitrogen ratio, earthworm has a higher one, he's gonna excrete his excess nutrient or nitrogen 
inside that tunnel. Okay, what that does, that changes the uh, bulk density of that tunnel. And it allows you to maintain structure. Okay, and maintain that tunnel. So when you get an inch of rain, you got these guys out there, it's gonna go in the ground. I learned that in Southwest Texas because I used to have to do irrigation uh, evaluations and I was in charge of measuring all the earthworms in Mr. Friesenhan's farm. We had an average of 18 to 22 earthworms per foot. So when he put two to three inches of water out with a center pivot, there was no problem getting it in the ground. I'd barely get my boots muddy after doing evaluations there, okay? So just know that they create this immense tunneling, increases the infiltration, okay? And these are the root pits that were there in Uvalde. You see these corn roots are actually growing. There's a corn crop, actively growing corn crop above these soil pits. You see the corn root hairs and stuff are growing through the tunnels. They're accessing the plant available nutrients that are inside that tunnel, okay? They're also accessing water. If you go down another foot, you're in mud, okay? We've got pictures of roots that go down to like six, seven, eight feet, okay? And we don't have that in a tilled soil condition, okay? It's just, it's not there. We're not creating the, the uh, habitat or the uh, necessary uh, diversity that we need to get it done. Earthworm casts are another issue. Uh, these earthworms, when they come out, they leave casts on top that have 11% more humus, seven times more nitrogen, 11 times more phosphorus, and nine times more potash. And there's certainly more available water, okay? This is Dave Brandt. Here's another interesting thing. These uh, tillage radishes that were mentioned earlier, that's like Red Bull for earthworms, okay? it's. Uh, what happens is, is that that tillage radish is able to cleave uh, calcium off of phosphorus. And those two nutrients are picked up by that tuber, by that tillage radish. So that earthworm is attacking that tillage radish because it has calcium in it. Remember that sometimes the earthworms eat uh, these uh, acidic residues. Okay, they get that in their gut. In order to break that down, it consumes calcium because they have calciferous glands in their gut. And they exude that calcium in order for the bacteria to work on the acidic residues. So it breaks down. It's kind of like a cow. They have biology down there that's going to help them decompose those, those acidic plant residues. Okay? And one of the things that it looks for is, is calcium. But again, you know, calcium is one of the most important things to have in that upper surface. That's one of the most important nutrients that you need to have. Actually, I also know that for you don't have calcium as a root grows, the, cal the uh, root will not grow in that direction if it can't pick up calcium. It'll start to veer off one way or the other, or it might be a physical type of compaction, but it can also be because it's not picking up calcium, okay? Because that's a necessary nutrient. This is Zach Yonta, this is, uh, kind of laughed about this when I told him that Red Bull for earthworms, he thought I was joking with him. We started planting tillage radishes down in South Texas and everywhere that year we had uh, enough weather that it, uh, de they decomposed, we had a frost, a freeze. But everywhere we had a tillage radish, we had earthworms now on his field. He got so excited about that and I've got him hooked, he's the Texas Farm Bureau director. And he, all he talks about now is soil health. It just amazes him all these different things that he hasn't seen for many years. Okay, the importance of that, when you get these tillage radishes and stuff and they break down, and I'm sure that'll happen up here uh, also, but when they break down, they leave a lot of available phosphorus around them, okay? And this is Dave Brandt in Ohio. This is where I learned about that. Um, he goes and plants tillage radishes in a straight line. And he does that just as people would use a, a phosphorus banding, pop-up fertilizer. That's how he uses tillage radish. He'll plant tillage radish, they decompose, and then he comes in and plants his corn right next to it, and he doesn't use any phosphorus fertilizer, okay? No pop-up. Doesn't need it, okay? So that's one of the practices now that he does consistently uh, on his farm. 
So we're still transitioning. We're trying to get away from the physical properties of the soil to these and, and enhance the management dependent properties, okay, which we have control over. We know that we farm sunlight. We know that we feed microbes and we're creating this. When we transition, we create these spheres of influence. That's where all of these microorganisms live. If you have a tilled soil, you don't have a detritosphere. If you have a tilled soil, you don't necessarily have earthworm and root channels, okay? Those are something that has to be built and you have to change your management practices. Pore spaces, you're not creating aggregates. You don't have the agratosphere, the aggregation. You don't have the porosity. The root zone rhizosphere is another thing. Plants put root exudates into the soil to stimulate biology, okay? They stimulate mycorrhizal fungi, they stimulate the free-fixing nitrogen bacteria because they have to be fed carbon. They stimulate phosphorosolubilizing types of bacteria also, okay? Now here's the secondary succession that Dr. Zach was talking about. You get uh, growth of pioneer species in areas that have been disturbed. So in other words, if you remove all the vegetation off the land, you're gonna see this natural progression of plants come back into play if you don't do anything, okay? You'll get annuals, biennials, perennials, shrubs, trees. Uh, I used to learn, I learned this whenever I did brush management in South Texas. Because if you don't learn to manage it, that 450 or $600 you spend an acre to clear it will go right back to where it is within 10 years, okay? You gotta learn how to manage these ecosystem processes and keep that pasture where it needs to be to grow grass, okay? Not trees, all right? So we need to understand this, but we also need to understand that as you increase the fungal complexity, as you get more succession, soil biological succession causes plant succession on top of the ground. I would always know how, you know how long it's been since they did brush management by the types of plants that were there, okay? Because you get that natural progression of plants, all right? Key here is to understand that when you get more fungal complexity, you get more balance between fungi and bacteria. So you start leaving residues on top of the ground, you start getting certain trichoderma, stubble digesters, then you start uh, getting mycorrhizal association of those plants that are mycorrhizal. So it's really important, nature drives these successional processes and we start to build more and more complex carbon compounds. When you look at nitrogen, I'm gonna focus on that. When we get those nitrifying bacteria, and I've already explained that, you get this uh, bacterially dominated system and you get nitrate as its form of nitrogen. As you start getting more fungal complexity, more of your nitrogen stays as ammonium. And then the other thing that happens is you start getting more and more microbial metabolites because of the increased biological activity. Okay, that's an organic form of nitrogen. And that's used differently by a plant. Inefficient, and then ammonium and organic forms of nitrogen are more efficient when it comes to water use by the actual plant. Okay, a plant will actually use three times more water if it has to process nitrate versus if it has to process ammonium or an amino acid, okay? And that's a lot, okay? So we wanna keep this system out of these, this type of zone, because this is where we're currently at, and we wanna take it up here to where we have a ratio of one to one fungi to bacteria in that soil system, okay? Then we get a balance of nutrients, we get a balance of all this other stuff. Now, I'll mention something else. When you start getting a bacterially dominated system with nitrate, understand that nitrate is an anion. So what happens in these bacterially dominated systems is you're gonna get an imbalance. Your plants are gonna pick up the water soluble types of nutrients, which are anions, more so than they will cations. Because you're depending on water to get it there. When you get biology into that system, you start getting more and more amino acids and some of these other things that can be used by plants. And as my old professor told me back from the 80s, he told me that plants did not uh, pick up organic nitrogen. Pooey, okay? That's not true. They do pick up organic nitrogen. The problem is they trained me as a, as a chemist on how to use herbicides. Well, her herbicides, that's organic chemistry. So if plants couldn't pick up organic chemistry or organic swarms of nutrients, then how do your herbicides work? 
That, that perplexed my professor tremendously and that he couldn't come, out, come with a comeback, you know, when we started discussing this. Okay, so these are just things that we need to know. We need to move forward and regenerate that particular soil, okay? Know that there's always uh, plant succession occurring in that system. We're trying to move it over here, but when you have disturbances, all of these disturbances move those systems backwards, and that depends on how far depends on the intensity and the frequency of that disturbance. Okay, so the minimal disturbance that we wanna do in those systems, we wanna make sure that we get the association with the mycorrhizal fungi and these types of things and we wanna maintain it there. Okay, so we need to understand the importance. We need to have some disturbance, but very minimal, okay, to keep it in that system. So what do you see right there? See cotton plants, I see this all the time. Look at that pigweed. Does that pigweed look healthy? Okay, so what ecological successional stage is that field in? What's supporting? Supporting the weeds, okay? You'll see that that weed is healthier. We take a mineral density of that, it'll have more minerals in it than what the cotton does right beside it. As you start to change the ecological successional stage, and you start to pay attention to doing no-till and cover, you'll see that start to change. Actually, there won't be as many nitrifying bacteria there, so the plant doesn't get nitrate. And what happens, it starts to be, uh, you get bacteria such as actinomycetes. The actinomycetes start supplying, instead of nitrate, they start supplying silicon to that pigweed. You'll see the pigweed get short and stout. It'll still produce seed, they'll still try to hang on, but as you continue to change that system, you will have a system that does not support that particular plant, okay? So it's important to understand that, okay? Soil health is more than no-till. This is chemically based zero-till farming. The problem with that is, is that you don't have the essential requirements for biological nitrogen fixation because you have to have live plants that feed free-fixing nitrogen bacteria, and you also have to sequester the humified or produce these, this humus in the soil, and that's provided to you by mycorrhizal fungi, okay? So we want to get more carbon in the ground, we want to transition that soil, we want to understand the importance of organic matter, and I'm going to talk about how we build organic matter. Building soil organic matter, there's two microbial types of processes that are involved in carbon cycling. One is the decomposition pathway that is up here, okay, that's in the upper surface. You're going to get this decomposition, most of that is mineralized. Most of your biomass is going to be returned to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Of course, if you've got a live living plant there, it's going to be recycled. You get this mineralization process. The other process to pay attention to is what's called the microbial carbon pump. We now know that photosynthesis and plant root exudates are now recognized as constituting the primary pathway for soil building. When you have mycorrhizal fungi uh, in this particular system, you start to humify. Okay, and I want to explain that process here. Let's talk about the decomposition. Decomposition, it's a mineralization process and it's catabolic. You lose carbon dioxide into the air. You do get the mineralization. You do get nutrients being cycled and stuff, but it's, it's very, very limited. You build up a lot of microorganisms. You get a lot of protozoa that eat the microorganisms and you get, of course, you get that uh, mineralization. Once you start to do no-till, then you're going to have microorganisms like trichoderma come in. Those are stubble digesting types of, of fungi that help you break down the hard to decompose residues that are out there, okay, from your previous crop. And the other thing about these type of uh, fungi is that they're also predatory. So I have a lot of people that always ask, well, you know, we're going to have all these problems, we leave these residues on top of the soil surface, we're going to have seedling diseases and all these other things. Guess what? Trichoderma eat all that. If you get those in your soil system and you build that diversity, trichoderma produce both cellulase and chitinase and they feed on organic materials and nematodes and pathogenic fungi. So it's like building a castle wall around those root systems. You have to understand that those are the things that are going to change. Those are some of the consequences of changing what's already been lost. You can build organic matter from the biomass that depends on how healthy your plants are. 
fungi digest complex compounds like cellulose, hemicellulose, and lipids. Bacteria cannot do that. I didn't realize that, but I'm old enough to remember back in the 60s uh, that we used to store meat in fat. And the reason we did that is because bacteria cannot decompose fat. Okay? I remember that because the old camp cook would always take uh, fat and lard and flop it in a pan. That's what I'd have for breakfast most of the time. But the thing is that when we talk about plants and soil, fungi digest those hard to decompose materials. And the point at which they de uh, decompose is they decompose over and over to about a 40% lipophilic acid content or lipid content. Okay, once it gets to that stage, it, that is a stable carbon in that soil. So if you have real healthy plants that produce more phospholipids around the cell membrane, okay, if you have say 2% versus say 6%, the 6% lipid content will actually produce three times more stable carbon from the biomass above ground. Unfortunately, we don't have very healthy plants that produce lots of lipid because of how we manage, okay? So, we want to talk about the microbial carbon pump. This is an entombing effect. We talk about entombing effect because mycorrhizae coat their hyphae with glomalin. That's very resistant to decomposition. So as soon as this process stops, as soon as those bi bi biology stops associating, you're going to see that glomalin left in the soil. That's where you get that deep dark brown color. Okay, and those mycorrhizae actually follow that root system down into the soil at depth. Okay. So it's a humification process, an anabolic process, it's building, and the mycorrhizal fungi, they're fed carbon by the plant, and then the mycorrhizal fungi, guess what? They feed the free-fixing nitrogen bacteria, and they feed the phosphorus-solubilizing bacteria. So you wanna know how we build organic matter in the soil, we build the, the, the nutrients, the biofertility, that's how it's done right there. We've got to get the mycorrhizal fungi association. I know I, when I was here uh, at a soil health training, I had one of the participants ask why it was so important and why I kept emphasizing mycorrhizal fungi. This is why, okay? You have to do that. Uh, they come in contact with more phosphorus, okay? They're an extension of the root system. They also pick up organic nitrogen. This is from University of California, Irvine. They found out that when they put amino acids next to the mycorrhizal hyphae, they got picked up and they were carried through the plant and went through the photosynthesis process. Okay, so we know that these plants pick up organic nitrogen. Okay, they're able to bridge gaps. Roots cannot do that. Mycorrhizal hyphae create bridges across pore spaces. They're able to conduct water and nutrients uh, to roots despite disruption of capillary water flow. The other thing about mycorrhizal fungi is when they coat their hyphae with this glomalin that produces a hydrophobic effect. So water accumulates on that fungi. And guess what the bacteria do? They use it as a highway. I didn't know bacteria can move in the soil. I thought they just grew in population or whatever, but evidently they follow that water uh, along these hyphae and they're able, that's able to transport them to different areas within the soil system. And I thought that was really cool, okay? Uh, mycorrhizal fungi also uh, end up uh, storing water. They form vesicles in the root. They form nutrients and water in those vesicles. Not all of the mycorrhizae do that. The other thing that they also store are fats. So as we get real healthy plants, we start producing more and more fats, lipids, oils. Those things are also exuded into the soil. Those things are also picked up by the plant. They're deposited in these vesicles like that, and that's an energy source. So you'll see mycorrhizal fungi go through stress better or drought conditions better because they have that to access, where non-mycorrhizal plants don't have that, or if they don't have the association with mycorrhizae, don't have that advantage you'll see them go through drought stress much quicker, okay? And know where you plant mycorrhizal plants, uh, you're gonna see the succeeding crop will mature quicker because of the amounts of nutrients and things that are also there that were produced by the mycorrhizal association previously. 
And, and here's the thing that I wanted to talk to you about. If you see this soil over here on the left, that's from a paddock in which the ground cover has been actively managed to enhance photosynthetic capacity. They're not using inorganic fertilizers there. They're just doing a good grazing practice and they're getting the cycling of nutrients and the manure and urine good distribution of that, okay? The one on the right is the profile from a conventionally managed neighboring paddock that has been set stocked and has a long history of phosphate application. They're using MAP and DAP uh, in that soil system. And what's happening is, is that that doesn't allow the association of these mycorrhizal fungi. So when you see this system managed in this way, you'll see that the mycorrhizae start following that root system down into that soil. That's why you get that darker color in that soil system. In the system where you're not following that practice and you're just depending on the decomposition pathway that I discussed earlier, you're gonna see that you're gonna lose carbon and you're not gonna get that dark brown color down, down in that soil system. Now, the advantage of all this is, is that when you get this over here on the, on the, that's on the left, you're gonna sequester more carbon, you're gonna hold 200% more water in this particular comparison and then all of the soil nutrients, including trace elements, have increased by an average of 162 percent. Okay, your calcium has increased a level of 277 percent. Your soils also buffered themselves. pH has changed from 5.2, now it's going back up to about 6.1 or 01. And that's a good thing because once you start getting that type of biological activity, biology controls the chemistry in the soil. It's no longer a chemical system, it's a biological system. So humic substances, uh, pay attention to that. Uh, when we build these humic substances in the soil, uh, this is the humic molecule. And I show this as an example, that hydrogen is going to slough off in that system. And then you're gonna get a negative two charge right there. Okay, this happens on the outside of a humic molecule and then it's going to attract all of your cations that you have. Those are important for, your, uh, for a nutrient like calcium, magnesium, manganese, copper, iron, zinc. All of these things are gonna be attracted and they're gonna be held in the soil because of the actual organic matter that has been built in that soil system, okay? So you attract, you hold all of that. Those are plant available nutrients. That's how you build a biological fertility. Uh, this is Gabe Brown. I suggest that this is a good book to read if you want to learn about regenerative agriculture. Uh, this is an example. Farm number one is an organic farm. A diverse cash grain, tillage, cover crops, no synthetics, no livestock. Farm two, minimum tillage. Two crops, moderate synthetics, no livestock. Farm three, medium diversity, no till, high synthetics, no livestock. Farm four is Gabe Brown, high diversity, no-till cover crops. He used one herbicide. He no longer uses herbicide anymore when this test was done. And then livestock. What I want you to notice, look at the amount of nitrogen that he has available in that system now. 281 pounds of N, okay? Phosphorus, in comparison to the others, he has over 1,006 pounds of phosphorus available to him, okay? Potassium, 1749. Look at the amount of water extractable organic carbon. That's actually the food source. That's actually the, uh, what the biology feeds on in that soil. You can tell how biologically active a soil is by looking at this particular number. That number's 1,095 parts per million of water extractable organic carbon. That's the food source of that biology. That's an indicator in that soil system. Look at his organic matter now. He started out like everybody else. Now he's built his organic matter level to 6.9% overall. Look at the infiltration rate. He's actually got uh, a horizon now, I think that goes down to like almost 28 inches, okay? He's got aggregation they've measured down to 48 now. So he's really paying attention to that photosynthesis, really paying attention to the root exudates, getting roots down in the soil, getting those associations with biology. And this is a very good example of all that, okay? No, we need to keep plants in photosynthesis uh, mode. 
We need the, the enzymes that help us to convert amino acids into, say, uh, peptides and proteins and all this. We need trace elements in order to do that, okay? So we have to maintain those trace elements. That's why we need to have that good aggregated soil that's always producing organic matter. Okay, this is Dave Brandt in Ohio using cover crops. Uh, this was a fertilizer cover crop demonstration. Uh, he's using 140 units of N, 70 units of N, half rate, and then no fertilizer. And then we were planting 10 species mix of cover, eight species mix of cover, and seven species mix of cover. What you see is, this was during a drought year, uh, you see that the no fertilizer rate with approximately eight to 10 species of cover produced the highest yield in that situation. The other thing was that was interesting, I just mentioned to you about protein. These plants are getting different forms of nitrogen. They're able to produce the proteins that are needed. Where he had no fertilizer applied, he had a higher, not only had a higher yield, but he had a higher protein content. Okay, that was because he's changed the biology in that soil system. Where they applied fertilizer, they actually got a reduction in protein. Understand, we're putting inorganic fertilizer out there, nitrogen. And then with fertilizer, full rate, it had the lowest amount of protein. What that means to him is that 9.1% uh, of protein means increasing value of grain by 27 cents. And for him that particular year, he made uh, enough to buy a new pickup truck that year, just because of that process right there, okay? This is from uh, John Kemp, uh, some other information that I've learned from Jerry Brunetti uh, and also Francis Chabousseau. Uh, there's a book that I'll show you here in just a little bit that's important. Uh, when plants produce complete carbohydrate, complete proteins, complete fats, lipids, oils, it's a building block type of process. And the degree of plant health and immunity is based on plants' ability to form structurally complete compounds, okay? Carbohydrates, proteins, fats, lipids, oils, plant secondary metabolites. I'm an entomologist also, and the reason that's important is because certain insects only attack plants at certain growth stages. And the reason for that is, is their food source. So you see some of these insects, if, if you get a plant out there that's producing complete proteins, you're gonna see little in the amount of aphids or white flies or larval insects attacking that particular plant because they cannot digest true protein, okay? They're simple insects, they have simple digestive systems. So that's something to pay attention to. That's why we don't wanna have nitrate as your predominant nitrogen form many times. We start to tweak and change that, you'll have less problems with things like yellow sugarcane aphids and stuff like this. Uh, but I just wanted to point that out to y'all. I'm getting to the end of my presentation. This is available, you can get that at AEA, uh, but it's valuable information to understand, you know, how to build uh, these particular processes, okay? This is the book about trophobiosis theory. The reason I'm bringing all this stuff up is because pests and disease organisms depend on their growth on free amino acids and reducing sugars in the solution. That's why we have a problem with insects. And this is also occurs when metabolic processes are impacted, okay? And I bring that up because all the types of herbicides and insecticides and those things that you use have an effect of metabolic function. They inhibit metabolic function in that plant. When that happens, if you pick up something like nitrate, as an example, you're gonna find out that you're gonna have more problems with insects because you're not turning that nitrate into a protein. And so it's a palatable food source for them, okay? I learned about that when I was an agronomist, a regional agronomist for Novartis Seeds, NK Seeds. It's so when whenever we put trials out, sorghum or corn, if the farmer used atrazine, okay, we had to make sure that the plants had maize dwarf mosaic virus resistance. Because if we use atrazine up to 20 parts per million, the aphids would attack that plant. And you'd have the lowest yielding variety in the trial. So as agronomists, that we didn't want to have the lowest yielding variety in the trial, we made sure that if they used atrazine, we made sure that we had a maize dwarf mosaic virus resistant variety there, okay? The same thing also happens when you use 2,4-D, malathion, and even glyphosate. You temporarily shut down that plant, okay? Particularly when you use things like plant growth regulators, 
That's another issue. I've, I've worked with a lot of cotton over my years. Whenever you use a plant growth regulator, it actually, that is a uh, shuts down all meristematic growth. That means that plant doesn't grow at the top, doesn't grow at, at the root system where it's growing, shuts it down. And you have to overcome that. That plant overcomes that particular application. Same thing with atrazine, all these things have to be overcome. They don't kill the plant, but they're, they're influencing that plant's metabolic function. That changes the nutrient, okay? Uh, we need to make our fertilizers biologically active, uh, more ecologically friendly. Uh, there's a common myth about nitrogen. You know, fertilizer-derived nitrogen that you apply, uh, only a certain percent is ever picked up by the plant somewhere around 33 to 55%. So we're actually applying probably more than half the amount of nitrogen is really excessive, okay? And so what we need to do, I'm just gonna mention these different things. We need to complex and chelate the, the nitrogen, quickly convert it to an amino acid, and that happens through the bacterial mineralization. Bacteria need soluble carbon, sulfur, molybdenum. We need to make sure that those things are there uh, in that soil system for this to work. Uh, I don't know if many of you have heard about micronized lenardite. Lenardite is where we get our humic acids and fulvic acids, but they're chemically extracted. Micronized lenardite is mechanically ground down to just a few microns. And you can use that to complex and chelate your nitrogen fertilizer, okay? What that does is it stabilizes your nitrogen in the soil. You won't lose it to leaching. So if you're not gonna lose it to leaching, that means that other 50% that you apply that's really excessive, the plant never picks up, you don't have to use that anymore. Normally we do a conservative, we only uh, recommend that the farmer cut back 30%, not 50. But we keep that there. We add molybdenum to help the free fixing nitrogen bacteria. And we also to convert nitrate that's still in that system. And then we add molasses to the system to feed the bacteria. If not, they'll start cannibalizing the carbon that's already there when you apply the nitrogen fertilizers. So you're trying to overcome that issue right there, okay? The other thing about this is that if you apply inorganic nitrogen, that's gonna inhibit nitrogen fixing bacteria that are in that soil. So this is another reason that we wanna do that. This is fertilizer impact right here. You see there's, there was no fertilizer, the band is right here. Once the roots hit that, they're clean and white. Another example, fertilizer used over here, they're clean and white, they're depending on inorganic uptake, okay? Soluble nutrients. Here they're forming biological associations. They're forming these rhizosheaths, okay? This is what we wanna see with a plant. When it comes to phosphorus, Know that inorganic phosphorus inhibits mycorrhizal fungi. Plants sense phosphate and stop sending sugars and exudates. There's no strigolactone production, which is a root growth hormone. So we wanna use things like micronized lenardite and complex the anions, which is things like phosphate, okay? And we wanna chelate things like calcium so that they're better and more available to a plant. Okay, so we do that by using these types of products, okay? Uh, so how to generate the optimal system, reduce the applied fertilizer, buffer and stabilize the fertilizer with micronized lenardite, add phosphorus solubilizing microbes and biostimulates to get it going. Benefits of improving soil health, it's changing the dynamic equilibrium state, the uh, management dependent properties, okay, in that soil system. Use a little bit of ingenuity. Know that two plus two no longer equals four. It's a biological system, it's exponential, okay? And agronomic efficiencies are optimized when soil health is maximized. And managing for a living ecosystem is key to optimum production. And we can take that production and conservation further with management systems that continually build soil health. Just try to capture the potential, okay? That's my address, uh, email address and phone number. Be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Even later on, I'll be here for the conference. And I'd like to thank you all for having me here. Thank you.
when we're uh, using insecticides with our cattle uh, running on uh, cover crop the insecticides ending up in the manure and landing on the ground how bad are we hurting our microbiome uh, is that lingering very long are we hurting anything you can have effect you know one of the things that's happening uh, I don't know so much as, as, you know, being in manure. I know if you use things like ivermectin and those types of things, those are killing your dung beetles, stuff like that. I do know that that's happening. I also know that when we use certain insecticides or herbicides, an example is uh, glyphosate, and this was information from Dr. Robert Krimmer that used to be with ARS. Uh, when we use glyphosate on a plant, understand that glyphosate is also exuded through the root system. And so it changes the bio community in the root system, in the, around the rhizosphere. It will actually kill plant growth promoting bacteria that are called Pseudomonas fluorescens. And then what happens is you'll have fusarium come in and replace them. Fusarium become pathogenic. Now I know Dr. Zach knows all about that. So that's something that you don't want to create. You're actually creating that. That's a management practice that you have to consider. So you really have to start reducing the amount of uh, glyphosate and some of these things that are out there. Now, I also understand that you know we have uh, restrictions on you know when you can come back in and graze after using particular herbicides, and I recommend that you follow that. You know, follow those labels. So a lot of times I was just at uh, no-till on the plains or Colorado Conservation uh, Tillage Association meeting. And I listened to the guy that was talking about herbicide carryover. He didn't know of any herbicide that could be used where you could come back in and graze right after it. Not gonna happen. You know, so I didn't hear, I didn't hear, if you said you were grazing after you using a herbicide, I didn't hear it from you, okay? So, but that's something that you need to pay attention to. That's paying attention to the label, you know, that's there. You don't wanna have those residues in there. 